Hi, my name is Adora Speed. Hi, my name is Adora Speed Talk, and today we're going to be taking a look at a kid's guide to U.S. government. Not a kid's guide in the sense of being watered down in any way, but a kid's guide in the sense that has all the awesome stories that I love reading about American history when I was your age, or I think that any adults could appreciate. To give you a preview, uh, we have our two founding fathers, Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. So Alexander Hamilton was Secretary of the Treasury, and he was also an aide-de-camp to George Washington, who you probably know as our first president. So um, you would think pretty dignified gentlemen. Well, Aaron Burr really hated Hamilton's guts because they disagreed tremendously politically. Just um, Hamilton was a federalist. He was for bigger, stronger central government. Aaron Burr believed in much more dispersion of power to the states. So that was just the basic reason they disagreed. So you might think, okay, another boring two people political disagreement, except Aaron Burr shot Alexander Hamilton in a duel and never got prosecuted. So yeah, that's, this is the awesome stuff that happens in United States history. Founding fathers dueling and people, you know, having scandals in Washington, D.C. And the fact that Washington, D.C. was actually a malaria and mosquito-infested swamp until it got drained to make the capital. Even then, a lot of people didn't want to live there. So this we'll all be talking about in the Kids' Guide to U.S. Government. First, we have to think about um, a house. So you might wonder, okay, what's the big deal with this house that's kind of falling apart? Well, this is what happens when you don't have not only a strong foundation, but also when you don't create a blueprint. And a blueprint is something that an architect creates to determine the structure of your building. It's a plan. Now, if you've ever tried to build a treehouse or build anything really with your own hands and it doesn't have a foundation, doesn't have a plan, you might have seen it fall apart. And there's a pretty good reason why. You need something like this to outline and to see, okay, here are the forces that might act against the walls and the windows and they need to be this strong and this tall. I'm not an architect, so I can only guess at what's going on there. But basically, you need to have a plan. What does this have to do with United States history? Well, today we're going to be looking at the architects who shaped our government and the documents that they created, blueprints of sorts, to keep the house of the American government still standing during the time. But first, let's see how this nation came to be. Our story starts on the eastern coast of America in the late 1700s. So, Eastern Coast America is saying New York and Pennsylvania, New Jersey, all these different things that we know as states now. And they were colonies. Although many of the people who lived in these coastal colonies had been born on American soil and lived and worked on American soil, they were ruled by a faraway British king. The British system of government was a monarchy. A monarch is somebody like a king or queen who rules by hereditary right. That is, if your dad was a king and your mom was a queen, then you'll be a king or queen, and your children after you'll be kings or queens, and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren, and on and on it goes, until somebody decides to kill you or get into a battle, and then it changes hands. But generally, this stays pretty solid, especially in these times. So that's the British system of government. And the word government, when we think about that, really refers to the laws that govern people and the people who construct and enforce those laws. So enforce is a pretty important word because when you think about it, a lot of laws can get passed, but if they're not enforced, they really have no teeth. So in enforcement is to make people obey laws. If you drive drunk, then you will get put in jail. That's pretty strong enforcement. Or if you rob a convenience store, you will get fined really heavily or put into jail, something like that. Anyway, when you do something wrong, it's law enforcement that makes sure you're caught and dealt with appropriately. So, that's government. Makes laws and enforces them. And in the 1700s, the major problem was, was that a lot of British citizens uh, did not have a lot of say in their government. As we saw before, this was a monarchy, so they didn't get to vote for any ruler. This was just someone who well, it was decided would be their king or queen. And American citizens had even less power to decide their own fate because they were in colonies, they were colonists. So when the British people passed, or the British Parliament passed an act that they weren't fond of, there really wasn't much that they could do. But they still had to pay taxes. And here we have really the crux of the dispute but between Britain and America, or so really how it started some of this war for independence. Because 
a lot of these taxes that were being passed, colonists thought, I don't want to pay it, I don't live in Britain, I'm giving it to this country that is across the sea, and it's to pay for things that I didn't decide to do, and furthermore, it's a monarchy, I don't really have a voice in government. This was one of the most important issues, was the fact that American colonists were not represented in Parliament. So, no voice, had to pay taxes, this was a big issue for a lot of people. So in 1775, the American colonists, led by George Washington, rebelled against the British, and you probably know, War of Independence or the Revolutionary War, and it was kind of crazy because the United States was really the underdog. We had this very um, put-together force of people, a lot of farmers from the countryside who didn't even have shoes or good rifles would just go and join this army, and a lot of people died because um, people didn't have the right equipment, there were long winters that were very harsh, but somehow, with help from France and with pretty good leadership, with smart moves and um, even some guerrilla warfare in places, the United States and this very improvised army managed to beat the very well-trained and numerically strong British army. People like Thomas Paine wrote important works that helped raise awareness about the American cause. His pamphlet, Top Common Sense, was distributed to hundreds of thousands of people, gaining a lot of awareness and, more importantly, support for the Patriots' cause. Benjamin Franklin worked as an ambassador to France to raise funds. He was not just famous for like the lightning and the key experiment. He was actually a very prominent statesman, and so he went to France. Everybody loved him. He was very famous for wearing his... Um, cap made out of fur or something, uh, and so quite a darling court, and that really helped the American cause a lot because getting money and military support from France was a big deal. Patrick Henry gave speeches about the fight for freedom, and in one of his most famous speeches he said a phrase that you have probably heard before, give me liberty or give me death. And he apparently did this while having his hand up in a really dramatic, like, knife about to plunge into the chest motion, so that's pretty awesome too. Now, as the revolution raged on, a group of colonists published the Declaration of Independence. So what's the big deal about the Declaration of Independence? Well, this was really a movement of outright Declaration of Independence because it was saying, here's what we don't like about the king. Totally not something that would be okay if you were afraid of um, getting basically punished by law enforcement from the king. And it wasn't a blueprint for government, but it outlined the ideas and values that were driving the new nation. It also explained, like with these grievances against the king, exactly why the United States was choosing to break away from Britain in the first place. So here were some of the complaints against the king. He vetoes many laws that would be helpful to the colonists, so a veto is to say, no, this law can't pass. He dissolves colonial legislatures when they stand up for the rights of the people. So this is addressing an issue where when the colonists had gotten together and created legislatures that were often elected by people, then he would dissolve them. And this obviously wasn't uh, a good thing for the colonists. He controls all of the judges. Now this one might seem a little bit strange, what's wrong with the king controlling the judges. Well, basically the reason that that would be a bad thing would be because of if the um, judges were controlled by the king, then it would be very possible that in cases, say, where somebody had criticized the king or if somebody had done something to a person who was extremely in favor of the king. But these judges might be like, okay, I'm always on the king's side no matter what. So that would be an issue for their partiality. He controls American trade and limits our trade opportunities. Britain was often trying to, at various points in history, trying to squeeze a lot of money out of American exports. So they would do things like limit who the Americans could export to, sometimes saying, okay, you can only export if you're on a British ship with British crew to Britain, which did not make Americans super happy. He destroys our useful rules and laws on a whim. So useful rule and law? Nope, not going to let that pass. Overall, from reading this list of grievances, we get a picture of a king who is not really acting with the colonists' best interests at heart. And this was really why the American Revolution wanted to break free from this king and Britain. So, as a good practice activity, you can try to write your own Declaration of Independence. Just think about what are some of the grievances you have. Could be grievances against adults, could be grievances against Mm, shopping malls, it could be grievances against really anything that you want to declare your independence from. 
and it'll give you a good idea of sort of how you shape Declaration of Independence and what it involves. So, moving on. Here is a word map of some of the big ideas and words in the Declaration of Independence, copying the very famous first part of it. You'll see government is very prominent, and so is happiness and powers. And these, and right, as well as right, pursuit, unalienable, self-evident, government, governed, these are all really important ideas. One of them is consent of the governed. The idea that if you are going to be governed, then you need to be okay with that. And you need to be okay with the laws that are passed. Governments, powers. So it really outlines, here's why we're doing this, as well as here's the ideals that will drive our new nation. But here's another problem. Even though the Declaration of Independence was this beautifully written document, it wasn't a game plan. It didn't provide clear steps of how this new beautiful government was going to look like, how it was going to act, would people be elected, would there be a king again in the Americas. So the colonists knew that if they wanted to succeed, they would have to outline their game plan a little more clearly. So in 1781, they released a new game plan called the Articles of Confederation. So some of you probably haven't heard of the Articles of Confederation before. The Articles of Confederation wasn't super clear. It gave the colonists enough organization to win the war in 1783, but they knew that they needed to improve their blueprint if they wanted to build an entire country, not just win a war. Because here were some of the big problems under the Articles of Confederation. Imagine for a second, I live in Washington State, so imagine for a second that you live in Washington State, and you want to travel to Oregon. So, when you travel to Oregon, you have to get your money changed from Washington coins to Oregon coins. You also have to familiarize yourself with some of the weird new laws that Oregon has, such as you may not drive more than 20 miles per hour on this highway or whatever. Okay, so that's obviously really imaginary because driving between states, has that ever happened to you? Well, under the Articles of Confederation, each of the 13 original colonies was its own state with its own government, its own money, and its own rules. So this could be a problem, for the unity of this new nation if each one of these states is very much like its own little country. And there was no comprehensive system of federal laws. So you killed someone in New Jersey, oh, that's not a big deal in New York. Or maybe it should be the other way around, I'm not joking. Um, so Articles of Confederation didn't provide much unity for the new nation, and no comprehensive federal laws, big issue. So on May 25th, 1787, Colonists held a convention or a gathering of people in Philadelphia, and their goal was to revise the Articles of Confederation. But what happened? If you know your American history, you probably know. They ended up creating a whole new document, which they called the Constitution. So the United States Constitution is a blueprint that outlines the structure of our country. An architect, as an architect creates a blueprint, they have to think about what forces might act against that building how the wind might act against it, how the rain, precipitation, all these different factors, um, how much weight it can carry, building capacity. And the architects of the Constitution, providing the blueprint for our government, did the same. They ensured that there was separation of powers so that no one branch of government would have too much power. And they outlined how people would elect their representatives and defined how much, each branch could, uh, how much power each branch of government could have as well as what they do. So the legislative, judicial, and executive branches have power fairly neatly divided. Now, of course, that can have its downfall, especially in um, more partisan societies. So people might have difficulty getting anything done if there's too much deadlock. But overall, the concept of separation of powers has ensured that um, we haven't had, say, a president become a dictator or the legislative body supersede um, the other two branches, typically. So. The separation of powers is a great example of how the Founding Fathers thought, okay, here's the things that might happen, and here's how we're going to protect against it. The Constitution has allowed us to become a world superpower, and the freedoms it guarantees have allowed us to speak freely and be creative and uh, create a diverse society, one of the most diverse in the world. So, the Constitution is an excellent example of really good planning. Why should you care? Because when you walk down the street and you say something bad about um, the president or someone in the legislature or just maybe you're saying something about a local official, you're not getting thrown in jail. Or when you're writing a newspaper article, 
you're not going to be thrown in jail. When you go to um, when you go to pray in a mosque or a church or a synagogue, whatever you do, you're not thrown in jail. So the Constitution guarantees a lot of pretty awesome freedoms that most people in the United States take for granted on a fairly regular basis. And um, up to this point, a lot of places in the world didn't have similar rights for everyone. So the Constitution, super good example of how blueprints create good houses, in this case, how a document can create a government. Now, quick look at the Bill of Rights, Amendment 1, this is where a lot of really important stuff happens. No law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So, saying Congress doesn't really have a relationship with religious organizations and won't make laws that say you can't do this or this. And freedom of speech and the press, super important as well, again, if you want to say anything um, that might be considered controversial otherwise. And the right of the people peaceably to assemble and petition the government for redress of grievances. This is all pretty awesome stuff we take for granted, being able to petition, being able to gather and assemble, um, but the Amendment 1 of the Bill of Rights provides. So, take a look at the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, Declaration of Independence, and think about some of the awesome stories from American history that you can discover.